Chapter 1. The Convergence. Ten years later. I love you, but this isn't working for me, Rasvir said, pulling down his welding goggles and flicking on his torch. The Copper Fox rarely surpassed first impressions. Equal parts gas bag relic and salvage yard special, the airship's mind was set on hanging dead in the sky. Inside its dank hold, sparks flared as a begoggled young man in his early twenties holded a metal plate over the most recently ruptured pipe. Don't worry, nobody's going to notice, he said, inspecting the messy patch job. After all, it looked right at home within the context of its cobbled-together surroundings. At a girl, Rass said, flicking off the torch and standing to stretch his legs. A low-hanging pipe sounded an atonal clang as it connected solidly with the back of his head. Stars flooded his vision, punctuating the fading glow of the retina burn from his arc welder. Not your fault, Rass said through gritted teeth. He gingerly removed his welding goggles, releasing a sweaty, tangled mess of dark brown hair into his face. He brushed it away, and as he did so, he caught his distorted reflection in the one redeeming feature of his ship, the massive glass container filling half of the hold. Rass had mixed feelings about the inherited wind collection tank. The replacement part was the last vestige of his father's lost ship, the Silver Fox, and reminded him that his entire vessel was a slapdash homage to his father's legacy. From the stained patchwork balloon to the third-hand engines, his ship felt like a child scribble compared to a lost set of blueprints. Extricating himself from the pipes, Rass walked to one of the twin scoop engines, he crouched and twisted the valve from the newly patched pipe, restoring the flow of energy-filled air from the outside to the machine. With a pull of a lever, the iris inside the steel barrel opened and shut, throttling the energy feed. He allowed himself a moment of celebration, even though another pipe would likely need his attention later in the week. A win is a win, he thought, flicking on both engines before climbing above deck. With the reassuring rattle of the engines once again filling the air, he let the cool wind whip his hair and ventilate his baggy third-generation clothing, drying the sweat worked up in the hold. At moments like this, Rass appreciated that his grandfather and father weren't small-framed men. After sufficiently cooling off, he cinched up the thin leather straps at his elbows and knees to avoid letting the wind play with the extra fabric. Staring out at the open horizon of white, fluffy clouds, he imagined the days long gone when a wooden ship like his didn't need the gas bag to travel from place to place over the... big thing made of water. He could never remember the name of anything below Atmo. The tension eased from his shoulders when he took a moment to appreciate the subtle beauty of the clouds, knowing that nobody would ever see them quite this way again. It was such a shame they would kill him if he ventured too low. The very first time his father took him down to the cloud level, the proximity to the abandoned world below became his favorite part of sailing. It sparked his imagination with possibilities from an early age, but gaps to peak below were rare after the clockwork war. The constant presence of clouds reminded him of a time when his father was the breadwinner for the family, and the responsibility of providing for he and his mother didn't weigh so heavily. Rass lowered the ship's collection tube to let it troll just above the cloud level. He prided himself on being a traditional wind merchant, but was painfully aware that it was only because he lacked the means to acquire the more modern energy hunting tools. Up on the bridge, the monitor beeped, alerting him to a shift in the local energy level. On good days, he would happen upon a level 3 source, but most days provided a 2. Level 1 meant he didn't eat. He climbed the stairs to the bridge and read the monitor. Come on, 4, he said as if asking the wind for energy had ever worked. Level 2. Better than 1 he said, pressing the button to begin pooling the wind in the collection tank. A chill swept over the bridge, causing Rast to hug his arms for warmth, rubbing some life back into them. The cold was a telltale sign there was less energy in the bowl to warm the wind, and he had put off spending money on a warmer coat for far too long. The trend frightened him. Having a bad economy was one thing, but having that economy literally powering his city's engines was another. The radio squawked to life at a jarring volume, the sounds garbled and static-filled. Gomer Tassie, o o o i Albert. The phrase repeated itself, picking up speed with each iteration before Rass unplugged the power to the box, killing the spiraling loop. He plugged the box back in before saying, Hold the tick. Transmitter's on the fritz. Over. He gave the device the usual thwack with the palm of his hand and brought the comm unit back to his mouth. Come again, please. Over. I just want to know how you haven't fallen out of Atmo yet, Rassy, said a jovial voice. Rass sighed. The voice belonged to Tibbs, one of his few remaining childhood acquaintances. He preferred Erasmus to Rassy, as his full name didn't prompt memories of schoolyard chants starting with Gassy. Send me your coordinates, I'll be right over. I'll stay where you are, Rassy, I don't need repairs, Tibbs said. Got something for you. I'll be right over. Over. Rass searched the skies for Tibbs, who found dangerously close buzzbys far more humorous than his targets did. There. 
Off the port bow, a gleaming silver ship came careening in and clipped just above the Copper Fox's balloon, forcing Rast to steady himself against the turbulence. The new airship made a lazy circle and sidled up to its wooden-bodied brother as both vessels slowed to a halt. Tibbs never quite lost his baby fat no matter how much time he spent working out. Those unfortunate enough to brush against his short temper knew not to make his size a point of conversation again, but he never held a grudge, and his easy smile was usually enough to set folks at ease again. Sauntering over to the railing, he waved for Rast to do likewise. "'What are you up to, trolling for twos?' Tibbs asked. "'Just patching collection pipes.' "'Why don't you buy a new set? How expensive could they be?' Tibbs asked. Rast knew Tibbs had never owned an airship long enough to need repairs, always swapping out for whatever new model looked the shiniest. He assumed Tibbs didn't actually know what a set cost. "'I don't mind getting my hands dirty,' Rast said, hoping to change the topic. "'So you don't need anything fixed?' Tibbs snorted a laugh. "'Does she look like she needs repairs?' he asked, placing a loving hand on the metal railing. Rast shrugged. "'I heard steering on the new models favors the port.' Now that you mention it, no, she's fine. You know, you might look into being a mechanic back on Verdant, Tibbs said. Welding goggles look good on you. Rast chose to take it as a compliment, smiling politely. It wasn't easy. My current employment suits me just fine, thanks, he said, knowing he might as well call himself a mechanic that dabbled in wind collection. A growing percentage of his income came from various repairs for stranded wind merchants. You said you had something for me? Tibbs' eyes went wide with excitement. Yes, yes, yes. He fished out a small wooden box from his cargo pocket and cradled it in his hands as though he held a rare commodity. You heard about the new version of Helios's knack vision, right? Rast nodded. He longed for a pair of the goggles that showed energy flowing on the wind, not least because he knew he was in the ever-shrinking minority of wind merchants still flying blind. Tibbs removed a shiny set of brass goggles from the box and placed them atop his head. Ta-da! he said with a flourish, jutting both hands out and spun slightly so Rask could appreciate the sides and back of the strap as well. Just arrived this morning. With this version, you can actually see the level of energy on the wind, percentage of potency and all, Tib said, quoting the promotional material. That's, uh, really handy, I'm sure, Rask said, disappointed that what Tibbs had to give him looked to be little more than a demonstration. All the benefits of being a knack without the pesky exploding part, Tib said. Not that you'd have to worry about that, right, Rassie? Rass hated how well-known his inability to sense energy was among the wind merchants in Verdant. Rass's grandfather was a true knack who claimed he could actually see the energy flying by, but he had run afoul of a concentrated amount, killing him. Elias had inherited his sixth sense for finding potent currents, making him a fine wind merchant. And then there was Rass, whose resounding deafness to the element gave him occasional difficulties with discerning port from starboard. Rass or Erasmus, if you don't mind. Sure, sure, Rass, I got it. Tibbs said. He dug a small cloth bag stitched with the Helios logo out of his other cargo pocket. My cousin Errol said you spent the afternoon with him yesterday after he blew his engines. All I could manage was getting him limping back home. He said you wouldn't let him pay you? Rash shrugged. He's going to have enough to worry about with two full rebuilds. You should have charged him. He's good for it, Tibbs said. I'll remember that next time. An awkward pause hung in the air before Tibbs said, Well... I don't really need two sets of backup, so I thought you might like these. He pulled a pair of goggles out of the bag. Rass knew the model instantly. An identical pair had been taunting him from behind a pawn shop's counter while he saved up. The original model of Knack Visions crafted by Foster Helios before either young man was born. It was difficult for Rass not to show his exuberance at the idea of finally owning his own pair of Knack Visions. Even if they were old, even if they didn't work half the time, and even if they smelled like Tibbs lost them in a ship's septic system for a month. They don't keep a charge well, but if you want them, Tibbs said, wiggling them in his hand as if the waving motion could make them more appealing. I don't know what to say. I... Rass stopped as Tibbs lobbed the goggles across the chasm between the two ships. Whether due to a gust of wind or Tibbs' lack of effort, it looked like the knack visions would come up short. Rass jumped up to the rope rigging and reached as far as he could before he noticed a rare clearing in the clouds, showing him exactly how far he had to drop if he fell. Instinctively, he pulled back to steady himself on the ropes, the goggles plummeted, vanishing into the grate below. Rass involuntarily imagined himself in their place. Really? Tib shouted at Rass, who clung to the rigging for dear life with eyes squeezed shut. Those were practically heirloom. Rass hung there for a moment as waves of vertigo swept over him. I would consider it a personal favor if you didn't tell anyone about this, said Rass, slowly opening his eyes and shakily lowering himself from the ropes. A flood of relief overwhelmed him at the feel of the creaky wood underfoot. The wind merchant afraid of heights? It's not exactly a secret, Tib said. Listen, Rass, 
I know it's tough to hear, but maybe being just a mechanic would be a good life. You could be the go-to guy instead of... Instead of what? Rass asked. He could feel the warmth filling his cheeks. Tibbs changed the subject out of what Rass assumed to be pity. Hey, I gotta go drop off my haul back at the collective station. You might check inside Framer's Valley. There was more there than I could collect myself. Probably want to catch it before it gets drained. Son of a remnant, Rass said. Framers? Are you insane? Oh, come on. The old Sky Pirate nest has been empty for months, Tip said. I'm sure Bravo Company probably moved on or got blown up. So you saw their base? Tibbs laughed. Like I'm going to fly through the sky mines to look at it. I just went to the valley, pulled a fiver. Seriously? I haven't scooped more than a two in... I don't know how long. Port Authority says the bowl might be running dry. Don't tell me you believe the diver team conspiracies, Tibbs said. Nobody's down there destroying our livelihood. Who could even get that close to potent energy? Besides, if there's a fiver in framers, Burden should have plenty to run on. Rast nodded and paused. Hey, Tibbs? Yeah, buddy? Is it true the guy started calling me a lack? The question held a hint of desperation, begging Tibbs to lie, and he knew it. The wind merchants back on Verdant had a leaderboard, irreverently called the Knack List, of who brought in the largest hauls, and the unfortunate soul holding the bottom spot unofficially received the title of Lack. More often than not, Rass found himself at the bottom of the list for long enough stretches that he feared the nickname had stuck. Framers Valley. Only trying to help, said Tibbs. See you back on Verdant? If India Bravo doesn't get me first, Rass said. What's she gonna do, gummy to death? Tibbs asked, flapping his jaw for effect. She's like what, 100? I don't know. Still young enough to run Bravo Company, Rass said. He knew she was only 50 years old, but wasn't interested in yet another conversation devolving into stories about how his father marshaled Verdon's forces to route the Sky Pirate assault. See you later, Tibbs. The ships drifted apart, and Rass watched the shiny new airship shrink in the distance before he set his course for Framers Valley. Even factoring out Sky Pirates, the valley held a reputation for claiming more than its fair share of wind merchants. The steep cliffs jutting above the clouds made it more a canyon than a valley, and the further down one traveled, the narrower and more twisted it became. If one ventured too far, a strong gust could damage a ship enough that even an incredibly potent hull would only pay for repairs. Rass had grown up with warnings from his father that only an idiot looking to prove his flying abilities would dare risk a ship in framers. But the only person he knew who had successfully navigated it was both incredibly handsome and talented. Rass's mother usually threw something at Elias after the advice and amended that her husband was only right about the idiot part. Elias never disagreed on the point. But today, Rass would have to brave framers to make up for his lost morning. Returning to the bridge, he opened the throttle and set the course he would travel for the next hour. Word of where to find the best collection points spread quickly among non-guild wind merchants, and Rass hoped Tibbs hadn't shared his info with anyone else yet. Nearing the maw of framers, the roiling clouds beneath the copper fox turned an ugly gray. The cliffs jutted too high for ships to fly above them, and Rass wondered how impressive they must have looked from the ground, disappearing into the clouds above. He slowed his ship to a crawl at the entrance. Off in the distance, specks in the sky indicated the active sky mines surrounding the cliffside base of Bravo Company. There wasn't another ship in sight, which both encouraged and concerned Rass. Nobody would be around to tow him out if his ship careened into one of the walls. The entrance was wide enough for half a dozen airships to share, and he would be safe as long as he didn't venture in too far. Tibbs said the collection point was inside framers, so inside he went. The storm beneath sent strong winds whipping around, and Rass only relented his death grip on the wheel to pull the lever lowering the collection tube. The trolling sensor took a moment to scan the area, then blipped at him. Level 4. Yes, Rass exclaimed. Only once had he ever stumbled upon a level 4 hall, and it had not only placed him halfway up the knack list for about a month, but also had given his mother a well-deserved break from working herself ragged to compensate for her son's flagging ability to provide. She had sold too many of her possessions already to make ends meet, but to her credit, she never brought it to her son's attention, even when he noticed the item's absences in the house. Making a mental note to thank Tibbs later, Rass smacked the collection button on the console, prompting the vacuum to begin filling the tank. The copper fox drifted further into the canyon, but Rass didn't want to pull back in case he lost the current. Filling his tank usually took ten minutes, and he felt reasonably certain his chokehold on the controls would keep him out of trouble for that long. However, halfway through collecting his level 4 haul, the trolling sensor blipped out another spike. Level 5. It would be a personal record, but it would also mean dumping his current haul and starting over so as not to dilute the fiver. He would need to fly into the canyon a bit further to chase the higher potency, but a level 5 collection would surely erase the lack title for at least a couple months, and if he could come back tomorrow and pull back-to-back -to -back fives, he could afford a used pair of knack visions. He pressed the button, jettisoning the level 4 air. 
Beep. Level six. The canyon narrowed. He chuckled nervously as he restarted the collection process again. It had been years since anybody in Verdant had pulled in a level six haul, and Rast noted that Tibbs probably only pulled a fiver because he wasn't willing to risk a few scrapes on his shiny ship. A loud shriek of wood scraping rock made Rast's skin crawl as a gust pushed the copper fox against the cliff to port. Rast told himself the damage was still worth pulling in a six, and rationalized how he would point to the scrape as a part of a war story from Framers. Granted, he would need to say, no, not that one, several times, but it would still be worth it. The wind's howl began resembling a wailing chorus. Rast decided it was time to turn the ship back toward the entrance and wrap up the rest of his collection process before the valley became too narrow to maneuver. As he spun the wooden wheel to bring the copper fox about, the indicator beeped level seven. Seven could buy a new airship, but seven would most likely get him killed. The high readings raised the question of what lay in the heart of the canyon, giving off such concentrated amounts of energy. Before Rask could give it more thought, he spotted a large gash in one of the cliff faces, and imagined the size of the vessel that had collided with it. Thinking about the ship wedged somewhere deep in the dark below unsettled him. The momentary lapse in attention caused Rast to overcompensate his turn, setting him perpendicular to the canyon's path while the wind pushed him deeper into the valley. The nose of the copper fox careened off of one of the cliff faces, jarring the ship and spinning it the remaining ninety degrees until it was flying backwards down Framer's Valley. Rast threw the throttle forward to battle his way out of the wind tunnel, but the engines failed to respond. The canyon began to curve to starboard, and Rast frantically tried to remap his mind to steer the ship counterintuitively as the force of the wind pushed him deeper into the canyon. Having the right gut reaction when flying forward often proved difficult enough, but this orientation forced him into an outright panic. He attempted to rely on his often incorrect judgment, which briefly brought success, then panicked when he second-guessed which gut reaction to mistrust. An incorrect spin of the wheel slammed the ship into an outcropping, knocking Rast into the wheel and pushing his ship down into an unexpected dive toward the clouds. He righted his ship just before dipping into their midst, but finding equilibrium proved to be impossible. With the ship in a terrible tailspin, all Rast could think about was how his father would never have been greedy enough to place himself in a bind like this. After another half-turn, the bow and stern of the copper fox lodged against each cliff face of the narrowing canyon, throwing Rast to the deck. He struggled to his feet and clambered down the stairs from the bridge toward its quarters. The ship shuddered and scraped a little further down the canyon with each gust. He threw open the door and dashed into the upheaved room. Sliding down beside his bed, he reached underneath to pull out an arm brace that ran from wrist to shoulder. Spools of wire and metal blocks attached all along its forearm exterior. His grapple gun. Rass had modified the gun so it could be loaded with either magnetic or traditional spike grapple cartridges that dragged a cable behind them once fired. The gun could also connect with a surface and then shoot the opposite end into something else if there was enough cabling left. Rass heard rocks crumble from one of the cliff faces. The copper fox lurched from its lodging, and Rass scrambled out of his quarters. He hastily secured the grapple gun straps around his left arm and torso, then loaded two spike cartridges. He aimed the device at the deck and squeezed the palm-activated trigger. The cartridge fired, and the spike lodged into the deck of the ship. He lifted his arm, spooling a bit of cabling with the movement, and lined up a second shot into the cliff to port. Before the ship could swing into that wall, Rass repeated the process on the starboard cliff, anchoring a ship. This isn't going to hold, he thought. He ran over and slid down the ladder into the hole to inspect the engines. One was making a horrible grinding noise while the other spewed steam, heating the cramped room. Flipping the switches on the wall to shut them both down, he noticed a piece of metal debris lodged in the gearwork of the grinding engine. Rass tried to heft the piece free to no avail. The wind above deck howled louder as the ship bucked against its tethers. He grabbed a heavy wrench hanging on the wall nearby and returned, giving the offending debris a stern whack to send it clattering to the floor. The engine grumbled back to life after a cycle, but before he could plug the leak on the other engine, a cacophonous screech gave way to a concussive blast, and the decking above him sheared away to reveal the bouncing balloon. Rass wished he had questioned the wisdom of placing two grapples so close together. Freed from its moorings, the copper fox bounded forward, sending Rast tumbling in a small room full of sharp and hard machinery, earning him a collection of small cuts and a myriad of bruises to come, if he were to survive this. One engine was better than none, and Rast regained his footing enough to stand for a moment before a series of strong gusts flung the ship from port to starboard, then dove. He watched his feet leave the flooring of the engine room as the ship dropped out from underneath him. He shot through the newly created hole in the deck until his back hit something soft. The balloon. Bouncing backwards, he saw the copper fox leaving him behind. Rass instinctively pointed his left arm at the ship and squeezed the palm trigger to fire off a spike at the hull. The line pulled taut, straining the strap around his midsection with a jerk, and Rass tumbled behind his ship like a lead kite as they fell toward the cloud level. 
A powerful updraft ended the nosedive of the copper fox, stopping Rast just in short of dragging his legs through the dark clouds before swinging him back up toward his ship. He pulled himself into a ball before colliding with the underbelly, almost knocking him unconscious. The pendulum motion left him dangling helplessly, watching his ship careen along unmanned. His eye caught some light ahead, the end of the canyon. Rass watched his ship scrape against a cliff wall one last time for good measure before bouncing into the open area. He entered a large, circular arena walled in by a grove of mountaintops. The wind swirled around the copper fox, gently spinning the vessel. Rass took a moment to collect himself until he realized his ship was slowly losing altitude, bringing him dangerously closer to the hissing and crackling clouds. Light flashed and skittered beneath his feet, followed by a deafening boom which echoed throughout the canyon, scaring him witless. No, 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 Rass said as he began climbing the cable up to his ship. His ungloved hands were raw from holding onto the cable so tight, and each hoist shot bursts of pain through his arms. He looked up and spotted a ship hanging high above the canyon walls, higher than he'd ever seen a ship fly. It had a familiarity to it, but one that was difficult to place when he was busy climbing for his life. Help! Rass shouted to the ship, his voice straining. He knew they probably wouldn't hear him, but he had to try. He climbed faster, barely staying a foot above the black swirl. The young man's arms burned with exhaustion until he finally slipped, falling into the clouds. The copper fox drifted in after him, erasing any evidence of Framers Valley's latest victim. Rass closed his eyes and hoped the process would be quick. Sensation flooded his body, and Rass cried out until he realized he wasn't disintegrating. He was getting soaked from head to toe. Having fallen beneath the cloud layer, he looked up and shielded his eyes from the droplets of water cascading onto him. The sensation reminded him of a dew bath on Verdant, only the water here was extravagant. He knew people used to have a name for water falling from clouds, but the joy of not dying overrode any memory of his history lessons. A jubilant laugh erupted from him, but a flashing streak of bright white light stopped his outburst and illuminated the area below in a brilliant momentary flash. Beneath him lay a circular field of something green waving back and forth on the wind. Nestled in the green lay the remains of a derelict airship, grown over with some sort of vegetation. Just beyond the ship, where the cliff met the field, a green glow emanated from a dark maw bored into the rock. In a matter of minutes, he floated down and landed with a gentle thud in the wavy substance, too tired to do anything but just lay in the soft stuff. It reminded him of the pictures from before man took to the skies, but he never learned the name of it. The strangeness of being on land finally caught up with Rass. There was a stability he appreciated, and for the first time in a long while, he felt at peace. Is this what my great-grandfather felt like? He wondered if he was the first person in that mode to touch the ground in 80 years. But why am I still alive? He didn't want to watch his ship crash, but there was little he could do to stop it. He just lay enveloped by the green, wondering how many ships had fallen prey to framers, and how the ship he saw earlier could fly higher than the canyon. The Kingfisher! It finally dawned on him where he recognized the mystery ship from. It fit the exact description of the ghost ship wind merchants told tales about. The stories about the ship hadn't begun as ghost tales, but since sightings were still reported 100 years after the Kingfisher and its crew ended the Clockwork War, the tales evolved. Some said the Kingfisher's captain, Halcyon Napier, was the first wind merchant because he discovered the origin of all energy. No two versions concurred about where the man was from, but they all agreed he was single-handedly responsible for turning the tide against the clockwork automatons known as the Elders. The grapple gun tugged on his arm, and Rass realized he hadn't heard a crashing noise yet. But before he could move, the tugging evolved to dragging, and soon Rass began parting the sea of green. Rass's fumbling fingers worked the release latch on the device, and the cable whipped away, leaving him lying in the field. Picking himself up, Rass glanced over to see what had become of the copper fox and found it drifting lazily a hundred yards away, bobbing in the breeze and bumping gently into a cliff wall. Rass waded through the tall undergrowth after deciding water falling on him was a unique but tiresome sensation. He headed toward the decaying airship, wondering what fate had befallen the crew until his attention was ripped away by what lay inside the rock. A nebulous, floating sphere of energy ten yards around exuded brilliance and danger, casting a green light all around it. It was the most beautiful thing Rass had ever seen, and also the saddest. Rass knew he had found Framer's source of energy, a convergence. Aside from the origin of all energy, convergences were the only things capable of putting off raw energy onto the wind. The difference between the two was the origin's energy emanated from the ground, while a convergence was composed of the absorbed essence of any man, woman, or child with an energy sensitivity who got too close to a potent amount of the resource. In the last years that humanity spent on the ground, convergences had obliterated densely packed populations, causing those sensitive to energy to erupt, destroying city blocks and continually adding new sources of energy to the wind.
The higher levels triggered the less sensitive to follow suit, forcing the depopulated world to erect what defenses they could. And just when it seemed everyone that could succumb to the curse was gone, the next generation proved energy sensitivity to be genetic. Rass sometimes wondered if Nax took up lives as wind merchants as a penance for the Great Overload, or just because they didn't want to be around cities. Regardless, the irony was not lost on anyone in Atmo that Nax now sought energy in survivable quantities to keep the world running. Nobody knew where the first convergences came from, other than they arrived shortly after the Clockwork War. Most considered them a weapon of the Elders, a parting gift after they failed to subjugate humanity. Rass guessed his insensitivity to energy was the only thing saving him from the same fate as the poor souls from the wrecked ship, and for once he didn't mind being a lack. The high energy readings from the canyon made more sense now. He estimated the convergence put off a level 8 rating, if not a 9, which required a guild-approved license to sell the hall because collecting such energy-rich air was extremely dangerous. But not to Rass, for whatever genetic fluke. A smile crept across his lips. He was going to be a hero, and better yet, a rich one. Convergences usually flitted about on the wind, necessitating that wind merchants find new collection spots. Whether something was beneath the clouds destroying convergences, or they were simply being blown out of the bowl, Rass wagered he was looking at Verdant's last fuel source. This convergence wasn't going anywhere, and nobody would be fool enough to risk flying through the canyon to find it. Verdant could relocate to Framer's Valley and have enough energy to run indefinitely. He would need proof, though. The amount of energy Verdant would need to burn just to move was more than the benefit of hovering over any Vagabond Convergence. But, if he could show them a partially filled tank of level 8 or 9 wind, then maybe, just maybe, he'd be able to convince them that this one was stationary. He could both save his home city and ensure nobody called him a lack again. He made his way to the Copper Fox, grappled to the railing, and with a little effort hoisted himself up to begin repairing the second engine and patching the balloon. It took a few hours and several salvage trips to the wrecked airship, but at last the Copper Fox was in mostly working order. Rass flew it near to the mouth of the cave, lowering the collection tube. The sensor read level 9, but all Rass required was a sample. Even that would be worth a small fortune. He mashed down the collection button. He didn't know if harvesting too much would destabilize or dissipate the convergence, so he decided to only fill his collection tank up to 10%. 7, 8, 9, 10. Rass pressed the button to stop collecting. Nothing happened. Twelve? Thirteen? Rass's eyes went wide with horror. No, 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 no! He ran down to the hole to shut off the valve at the collection point himself, but the rusted old valve wouldn't budge as he had never needed to stop energy from entering the tank before. He moved to shut down the generator powering the collection unit. It stopped, thankfully, but the vacuum process had already begun, and if he broke the tanker pipes, he would only release an unstable convergence into his ship. Thirty-four? Thirty-five? Rass bounded out of the hold and slid down the collection tube. A horrendous screaming noise assailed his ears as if a choir had been set on fire. His stomach nodded and heart plummeted as he watched the perfect sphere of energy start to fluctuate in shape. He landed inside the cave and tried to pull the tube away from the convergence, but the sphere pulled the tube back. Within moments, the convergence collapsed into energy on the wind, to which Rass was completely blind. He knew, without a shadow of a doubt, he was now the richest man in Verdant. He also knew he had just sunk her.